Hello and welcome to the Great Dialogue. You know, the 2014 Kentucky General Assembly uh, is now officially in its veto session where the Governor Steve Bashir has the opportunity to review all the legislation that has been you know, come, uh, before him and decide, uh, approve or veto. And then our legislators will have to reconvene in, on April 14th you know, to take an action on that. So kind of get an insight of what happened and what could happen and uh, some of the highlights. So we have uh, invited uh, Representative Tommy Thompson you know, to speak with us today. So you know, Tommy Thompson, uh, always welcome to the Grad Dialogue. And uh, we are so honored you know, that, that you represent uh, you know, the Davis County along with you know, all the seven counties that you work uh, together on that. So, so uh, I know that uh, you serve on the uh, District 14. Uh, and also, you know, uh, have a leadership position in the Kentucky General Assembly. So it's been a very, very great honor for us. So let's go ahead and start with that. I think one of the biggest highlights seems like was the, uh, the you uh, guys all, and all your colleagues in the House and Senate, uh, you know, have uh, finally passed a, a budget bill and it's gone towards, uh, you know, governor's uh, to signature and everything else. So tell us about, uh, you know, things happening there. Uh, you know, were you able to convince some of the things that, you know, were beneficial to to the state as well as over seven counties and especially in Owensboro area. So, would you attend? Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, yes, it's very positive that we were able uh, about a week ago to pass a $20 billion two year budget in a bipartisan way to that I think, given the constraints we had, was a good budget and will allow Kentucky to move forward. And this really comes kind of on the heels of um, over the last six years, we've had to cut about $1.6 billion out of our budget. Uh, and um, We've done that by tightening our belt, doing what a lot of people have had to do at home while we've had this economic contraction. But fortunately, our revenues are improving, uh, but not significantly. Um, over this next two-year budget period, we've got about $500 million of new money to deal with. But I think that this budget uses that judiciously and mm -hmm. will provide the best dividends for Kentuckians mm -hmm. that we can gain out of the investment of that money. Mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, the emphasis was, was on reinvesting in education, right. which we haven't done in some years. We're losing a little bit of our momentum. And certainly, job one for Kentuckians, I think, is education and being able to give our kids the skills that they need to be successful. Uh, so we reinvested in education. We increased the SEEK formula for the first time since 2008, uh, which is the basic school funding formula. Um, we extended uh, flex focus funds. Those are the right. funds that go into extended school services, safe schools, uh, professional development, textbooks, technology, those types of things. Uh, we were able to give our teachers for the first time in years a raise, 1% the first year of the biennium, 2% the second year. Uh, we were able to invest in preschool, which uh -huh. is so important. I saw a study the other day that said that two thirds of Kentucky fourth graders were unable to read at grade level at the fourth grade and they may never catch up so right. we need to have earlier emphasis on education with preschool so we expanded preschool so I think uh, again education was a big winner and it needed to be that's where a lot of our emphasis was uh, certainly another area was in health care um, we have provided about 1,200 more slots for three programs that will help Kentuckians with developmental disabilities mm -hmm. to, to be able to live at home and have services at home as opposed to having to be so to speak institutionalized uh, we restored money to daycare, which was frozen when the federal government earlier last year cut that program. And so many people that need that daycare <laughs> assistance to be able to uh, go to work, uh, to be able to continue their education so that they can improve themselves and build their career. So daycare w was a big emphasis. And then another area that's in, have been important and grad's been so involved in it was uh, we put more money into the expansion of broadband, right. about right. $50 million altogether over the, over the biennium, but to provide more internet and more capacity, <laughs> more broadband. Uh, I hear so many people call me and say, you know, we need more high speed internet right. for my right. business. We need it for school. Mm -hmm. So we put more money into that area. So I think on balance, again, it was a good budget, but the mm -hmm. key thing about it is we passed one on time. It was bipartisan and we won't have to have a special session. So more or less, you know, what you're describing also some other stuff that is in the budget is uh, kind of sounds like as you define re reinvesting Kentucky into for the future uh, in education and also in, in broadband and everything else. Now, you know, locally, you know, when we have the legislative breakfast, you know, that we do at grad or the, done by the Chamber of Commerce, the one one project locally I used to come out single out and that you've been working on for many many sessions which is the uh, you know, tax center for yes. you know so we're coming on that and you know where did you guys ended up you know with that project yeah Jatin certainly I think the most important component for the, those of us in Davis County and Ohio County in uh -huh. this region uh -huh. was the funding finally for the Advanced Tech Center too. As you would mentioned, uh, I've used the analogy before, we've been between third base and home right, right. on this project for about <laughs> seven years. And we finally got all the way home. There was um, $145 million in new projects, one for each of our 16 KCTCS mm -hmm. campuses. Mm -hmm. And that will allow our uh, ATC phase two at mm -hmm. the community college to be funded. And 
the source of that funding is going to be by a small increase in student fees, a per hour student fee increase, which they really haven't had, don't have any student fees compared to what our universities have like UK and UL right, and our regional right. universities. So I think this is a small fee to pay for their advancement. And then the balance of the money will have to be raised locally. So here uh, for ATC2, as we've called it, it's about a $13.5 million project. About $9 million of that will be paid for by those increase in student fees mm -hmm. uh, statewide. There's about 100,000 people in the system. And then the other $4.5 million will have to be raised here locally. That's but right. I think we can do that because our industry really needs that training. They, right, need, to, right. they need to train their future workforce. We need to make sure that our kids have the skills and the trade abilities to be employable. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a perfect partnership between the business community and the education community. You know, we can't have economic success <coughs> unless we have academic success. So I think this is a great program. It's going to be a way that we can get that project finally built and provide the training opportunities for our workforce both of today and tomorrow. The other thing for our district is, even though it's not final yet, but our road plan right. is very generous and very helpful <coughs> to help increase our commerce and our traffic flow here in the region. Uh, of course, we continue money for the bypass completion. Absolutely. Um, We've got money to continue the very much needed Highway 54 expansion. Right. It's going to be, you know, going out. Uh, it's about all together almost a $60 million project. We got continued money put in the budget to continue that project. Um, we've got some money in there that, that was going to make, as you know, we did the roundabout out at 81 and 56 right. in the western part. That would make, once that roundabout, you come out of it and head toward Parish Avenue, there's a little stretch there that's not four lane to the bypass. Mm -hmm. This would allow that to be four lane. And then uh, was able to get some money in there for Thruston Deermont Road, which is very heavily traveled right. off of Highway 54. So, but but also in Ohio County, which I was really pleased with, I was able to get a project in there. As you know, they have one of the, the best located industrial centers, Bluegrass Crossing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 1,200 acres <coughs> right at the confluence of the two parkways. And we were able to get some money in there to, um, to put a new entrance road into the park, which now goes through a residential area and it's kind of curvilinear. So I hope we'll be able to hold that when we get the final road plan uh, approved in the mm -hmm. next couple of weeks. So <coughs> by and large, some good things for our district. Mm -hmm. I think overall, you know, the, the road project itself, you know, the, the, the road bill, you know, it's going to have a lot of positive impact on the Grad region as well as Owensboro Davis County. Yes. Now, one of the things that you know uh, has been talked about in the past during the session is the House Bill One. You know, when it relates to the uh, minimum wage, uh, right. I know there's a lot of debate about those things. So, what do you, what do you, what are your comments, and what do you think you know, happen on that? Yeah, Jatin, we really felt strongly in the House right. that we needed to do something to increase the earning capacity. Of, of folks that uh, have been at the bottom of the economic spiral. There's about 60,000 Kentuckians today that are at or below minimum wage. And what's interesting when you kind of dissect into that, uh, about 70% of them are women. Wow. And about uh, <coughs> probably half of them are over 22. So some people think, well, they're just 17 and 18 year olds, they're not. And about a third of them are full-time employees. We haven't raised the, the rate since 2007. So we were gonna radically over three years, mm -hmm. raise it like a lot of other states are doing because the federal government hasn't acted to do that. Mm -hmm. And we just think it was the right thing to do to give people <coughs> a, a sustainable, give them an earning wage, give them a living wage, if you will. And, and that'll really bolster the economy. Not only will it help them to be able to pay higher mortgage payments, their electric bill, their insurance bills, you know, help clothe their families because so many of them are living in poverty rates now at that wage where it is. But it'll be uh, an, an injection of money into the economy because those people will spend those extra wages. So I think it'll be a boost to the economy. So <laughs> we, were, uh, we really felt like that needed to be done. But candidly, uh, I'm not too optimistic that it'll be uh, passed in the Senate. So uh, probably won't uh, go anywhere this session. Hopefully, we'll have a better, <clears throat> better chance next time around to discuss more. Yeah, and better. I think during the interim next year as we go in, that <coughs> right. that certainly be uh, one of the top bills that we'll focus on again. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, another one that was uh, talked about uh, that we made, that mentioned earlier uh, before the show <clears throat> was the medical use of the uh, cannabis oil. Uh, that has also been a hot topic, too. Right. Uh, so what are the, some of the pros and cons on that bill? Yeah, Jatin, that got a lot of discussion for a lot of reasons. We've all seen what's been going on in Colorado and Washington right, State where right. they approved it. Um, both some, uh, some real energy behind it, but some real concerns also, particularly from our law enforcement folks, for good reasons. So what we ended up doing was a compromise, which I think was a good compromise. It's going to allow the use of what's called cannabis oil, which is a derivative of marijuana. Uh -huh. And this oil uh, will be allowed the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville Med Schools will be able to do research research into this. And also anyone that's a member of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's pilot program uh, will be able to use and, and have the ability to use this cannabis oil, this derivative. And where we think it can really help, and we heard a lot of testimony on this, is that uh, for people that have had uh, severe, severe seizures right. as a part of epilepsy, uh -huh. and this could work where other drugs for that have not. Right. So, so those folks that are under that test program will be allowed to have this administered, and hopefully it can give them some hope and some relief. So I, I think that was a good first step. Mm -hmm. Obviously it doesn't allow the recreation 
recreational use of it, which so, and the abuse I don't I think can be tempered right. because of, of the fact that they have to be on this <clears throat> pilot child program. But it was a good first step, and hopefully more than anything can help these folks and, and these young people in particular that have not been able to have any relief before. So that that could be also on the docket for the next time around and see how the other states have been, you know, uh, uh, going through all the, some of the issues. Yeah, that's a good point because I think there's some 20 other states that <clears throat> right. have allowed some limited use of marijuana for medicinal purposes, and we need to learn what their right, experience right. is, what's been good, what hasn't worked. So maybe we don't make some of those same mistakes, but if we can help people, particularly those that are experiencing those seizures in a controlled environment, uh, I think that's positive. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Tommy, I think uh, overall, you know, there has been some, there was some ups and downs of the session. Uh, so overall, how would you classify the, you know, 2014 session, you know, as you left uh, Frankfurt? This yeah, Jatin, you know? we had um, almost 600 bills wow. uh, authored in the House, and, and we had um, over 300 in the Senate, so a lot of bills to look at. But I think certainly some of the high points um, were we, we passed a public-private initiative bill, right. so-called P3-type projects, <laughs> which will allow uh, public projects like roads and bridges right. and those high-profile infrastructure-type projects to be built by private concerns and then have that partnership with and that's the way candidly a lot of projects will be built in the future and probably the only way a lot of them can be built in the future uh, we passed an adult ab abuse registry which i think right. is really important to right. curb and retard the abuse of our seniors and, and i think that was a real positive move uh, we passed a cyber security bill that right. was sponsored and, and yeah. advocated by, as you know, Adam Eaton, our right. auditor. Right. And that's going to allow the state as such a repository of personal information. You know, they have people's tax information. Sure. They have their social security numbers. So if there's a breach to that information, they then will notify mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. citizens that there's been a breach, and you can take action to, to protect that. Mm -hmm. And also another positive thing I think we did was that we, we limited the sale of e-cigarettes to minors. Heretofore, they've, they've been unregulated, and we know how exponentially e-cigarettes are growing. But today, prior to this legislation, anybody could use those and some of them you know have some uh, sure. some ingredients that just aren't good particularly right, for right. minors so I think that was a high probably on kind of the disappointing note um, I was really disappointed that for about the sixth time we passed in the house a bill that would restore voting rights to uh, convicted felons but these are low risk low right, level right. um, nonviolent mm -hmm. offenders mm -hmm. you know who paid their debt to society who served their sentence and just wanted to have their rights restored so that they become productive citizens again we've got about 180,000 people wow. right now that have served their sentence they would be eligible to have their rights restored mm -hmm. and I think there's only two states now that don't automatically allow your rights to be restored mm -hmm. once you have uh, served your debt to society. So, over, so overall it has been a positive and, uh, and a lot of things came out of it, you know, like right. you said, reinvesting in Kentucky in education and also for the future, which is a great, uh, and as always, I'm sure some of the low part, uh, low bills are going to come back and, you know, you're going to provide the leadership on those. Uh, Tommy, thank you very much. Has been always a great friend and a great, great legislator for us. And uh, we always count on you, you know, to really carry the water for us. And also, you know, we're fortunate enough to have you working with all of our colleagues in, the, in, in Frankfurt. So well, thank you for being on the show. Thank yeah. you. It's a privilege yeah. to serve the people of the 14th Legislative District. I always enjoy visiting with you and uh, look forward to our next discussion. Well, thank you. And again, thank you for watching The Grad Dialogue. We've been talking to Representative Tommy Thompson about what happened in General Assembly in 2014 and some of the positive impact that it would have on this region. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Grad Dialogue. This month, my guest is Aaron Horner. Mr. Horner uh, joined the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security, and he's, he's the Deputy Executive Director since uh, to January 2008. Uh, his public service career began over 20 years ago when he worked for uh, Congressman uh, Con Congressional Page for Congressman uh, Ron Mazzoli. He went on to graduate from the University of Kentucky and with a major in leadership and public policy. Aaron's uh, first post within the state government was in the Revenue Cabinet, where he began as a principal assistant and later moved on to, a, to serve as the Director of Division of Technical Support with the Department for Property Evaluation. It's a long title, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Most recently, Aaron uh, served as Disaster Representative uh, or District Representative for Kentucky's 3rd District Congressman, Congressman, and where he was uh, responsible for the Transportation Army Corps Engineers and also the Labor Issues. Aaron, welcome. Uh, for, you know, for, the, for the audience, uh, they're going to wonder why we have Aaron Horner uh, you know, as a guest. Uh, you know, homeland security and, and uh, emergency planning and, you know, citizen core, all those things are, you know, very, very much important, you know, for a region, especially for a, you know, uh, ad district, you know, we work with the seven counties and so. So without the assistance of homeland security during the time of this, from the disaster or during the time of, you know, planning for the, you know, for the uh, mitigating disaster is, is, is invaluable. So again, welcome and I want to thank you for everything you. you guys do and your office does for the grad. So let's go ahead and start about that. You know, what is the office of homeland security? instead and what are some of the roles that the, you provide to the you know, regions and the counties? Well, we do four main functions. Uh -huh. uh, we operate what's called a fusion center, which uh, facilitates information sharing between local, state, and federal government. One of the main uh, recommendations of the 911 commission uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, after September 11, 2001 was to 
ensure that information was shared between the federal government, state government, and then also with our, our local units of government. So we have uh, an ILO program, an intelligence liaison program with uh, police officers, uh, sheriffs, mm -hmm. um, the fire service, and public health has also been incorporated mm -hmm. to share information. If we see something suspicious, to report something. So, so you collect all the information from all the uh, cities and counties and cities and counties and all the. Then, then goes to Frankfurt. Then you guys you know, analyze and let us know hey, something is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, I say, Massaging the data, so to speak, right, of, right. of what trends are we seeing, and right. just not having a silo of right. what's happening right. here in Davis County to know what Webster County as well sure. as McCracken sure. County are, are right. doing. So that information sharing is vital to uh, kind of uh, thwarting threats sure. and seeing trends. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a grants uh, division that bestows uh, first responder grants mm -hmm. to different mm -hmm. local communities, and many of the grad communities have been right. recipients right. of that, from radios for first responders to uh, hazmat bomb squad equipment, mm -hmm. all, all the way down to turnout and jaws of life uh, type of equipment that can be used in any type of disaster. Mm -hmm. We um, have a wonderful relationship with GRAD and some of the other area developmental districts for community mm -hmm. outreach and ensuring that the public knows how to prepare themselves for impending disasters, mm -hmm. to take care and, and, and be self-sufficient for a few days before relief can come, uh, as well as reporting suspicious activity mm -hmm. just through normal citizens. So really, you know, I mean, that's, that's a good thing to know because, in, you know, in, in, in typically in, in, in government, uh, 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 situation in the local, state, or even national, you know, we tend to react, you know, rather than, mm -hmm. you know, act uh, or pre, you know, pre plan. So, what, you, what you're talking about is uh, getting ready rather than just you know, look for what to do now when there's a disaster. You know? So, mm -hmm. this is an excellent way of analyzing, of getting everybody empowering to work towards, uh, you know, the, the, the potential hazard or something. You know? And this part of the state was devastated by the ice storm. Yeah, and so many yes. people, you yeah. know, were without electricity, right. without right. a way to communicate. Mm -hmm. So, we just emphasize uh, preparedness planning for your family, mm -hmm. uh, for your pets, mm -hmm. um, you know, which, which are vital to so many. Uh, so, so many families or family members, and then also communication planning. When we can't use our cell phone device, when maybe the landline is not going to work, uh -huh. how are we going to communicate with each right. other? Where are we going to meet up? Who's going to pick up the kids? That type of thing. Right, right. So, uh, so you work with almost every level of uh, uh, emergency folks, or even uh, people you know in, in engaged in, in first responders or preparedness planning and everything else. You know, we, you know, you, you've been you've been working with us and you know, helping us, and uh, people hear this term called CERT. You know, the uh, citizen. Uh, the community emergency, emergency response team, right, yes. Yeah. Can you comment on that and why they are so important to have in each of the community a CERT team? And CERT's been uh, extremely embraced here in, in the grad area. It's a way for, for citizens that want to volunteer to help out in disaster relief efforts to receive mm -hmm. kind of some rudimentary training. There's eight, nine different modules that they encompass from uh, basic first aid triage all the way up to terrorism and mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, search and rescue, you know, gridding it out to help uh, first responders find somebody that, that has been lost, so to speak. And and they always have a final exercise uh, that encompasses some of these disciplines. Mm -hmm. And it's a way for, for people that are, that are really committed volunteers that want to do something to help their community to be a part of mm -hmm. a volunteer effort in emergency management. Because we're only one disaster away from really overburdening everybody at the local, right, state, right. and even really, to be honest with you, federal level. So the more bodies that, that, that can assist and help uh, is what we're looking for. So recently you have contracted with GRAD you know, to, to work with the, uh, the, some of the CERT uh, team members, you know, train the trainer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So to go out and train more trainers, uh, you know, in, in other parts of the state, eventually that would, uh, so then more and more people get engaged and become a CERT volunteer. Yes, state, yes. Right? Okay. And you all have a wonderful group of emergency uh -huh. managers within these counties that uh, yeah. has, has very much embraced this program, embraced volunteerism. That's probably part of that spirit of Western yeah. Kentucky that, uh, yeah. that, that's so wonderful. But they're actually going to be teaching this, this train the trainer class all throughout the Commonwealth over mm -hmm. the next two months. And it's just a pleasure to, to work with you all and, and to have actual people that work with CERTs on a daily or weekly basis go out out and teach best practices to other parts of the state. So if people watching the show, if they want to get involved in two ways, you know, become a volunteer, uh, how do they go about it? They can either contact us at the uh, Kentucky Office of Homeland Security, uh, we're our website, or um, GRAD. GRAD has a program director, uh, Judd Pomeroy, who uh, heads up that for, for GRAD. But also, they can just contact their local emergency manager, mm -hmm. who uh, will have some information. And I believe all the counties within GRAD have, have different CERT classes uh, that are available different times of year. Oh. You know, uh, the, uh, everything more or less came into, into being after the 9-11 you know, disaster we had nationally and Homeland Security and getting every community to get prepared and everything else. The time goes on, emphasis goes down, the money goes down, everything else, but your office has continued the you know, interest and, and, and preparedness you know, in, in here. So what do you, what do you anticipate? You know, some of the, you know, uh, could be a potential uh, um, disasters or emergency we should be concerned about? You know? Well, the one thing, and especially in this region of the uh -huh. state or just really our state in, in, in total, is um, a possible earthquake. 
That's from it. the New Madrid Fault, right. or um, up in Indiana, where we've had some magnitude uh, five plus uh, earthquakes over the past few years. The devastation that could, could occur during right. an earthquake right. is, is something that's real. And it's not just California. We, we have one of the largest faults in this right. central right. part of uh, the United States, uh, even more so than, than California, even though they're a little bit more active. Mm -hmm. uh, so preparing for an earthquake and preparing for what resources uh, are going to be needed to respond to that disaster is, uh, is, is unbelievable in a planning mm -hmm. stage because, um, as, as so many people have articulated, Infrastructure, whether it be road, culverts, uh, uh, gas pipes, water lines, are all going to be damaged with, a, with an earthquake. So shipping supplies, getting supplies to affected populations right, right. is going to be extremely difficult. Right. And in a lot of areas, they're going to have to be flown in on helicopters because there's no way to get a semi with cots and food and supplies to those victims. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, in addition to the, the physical disaster that, you know, that, that you've been prepared and, and working on those things to, to alleviate or at least plan you know, for you know, rescue efforts, uh, Lately, we hear more about uh, the security, you know, the, the cyber security. I think mm -hmm. this morning, the national news, they talked about, you know, told, told everybody to you guys go back and change your password. There has been some breach of, you know, cybersecurity. So does your office also get involved into the cybersecurity, what needs to be done? Or at least we do. I, you know, that is such a technical uh -huh. uh, discipline that, it's, that we don't really have all the tools in our office right, to deal with right. that. But it's a partnership that we've had with the Commonwealth Office of Technology, as well as our federal partners, DHS and the FBI, that really do have those resources. Uh, we had a, a state cyber exercise actually earlier this year uh -huh. Uh -huh. in which we conducted and, and had all the different agencies from government uh, be a part of that. It's the number one concern of the FBI. Right. It's right. the number one concern of the Department of Homeland Security. And they're both foreign and domestic actors that are trying mm -hmm. to hack into our system. Mm -hmm. As I've, I've said many times, you know, government in any group or business that has data, right. that's what they're after. Right. And, and right. data right. is the kind of the oil of the 21st century. Right, right. So, so that, that's what the House Bill 5 in the General Assembly this year has been dealing with them is maybe making state uh, records and local records more secure. Yes, uh, the state order Adam Edlin uh -huh. uh, really initiated that legislative proposal and it's passed both chambers, I believe it's uh, already signed by the governor, uh -huh. which would implement a breach notification to the citizenry if there were a cyber intrusion. Uh -huh. We've seen this down in South Carolina, we've seen it recently with Target when they had all their credit cards right. that were right. swiped. So it's making sure that we as a, as a citizen uh -huh. are notified if our information is compromised. And government houses so many records right. from right. income yeah. tax records right. to social security numbers, it's, it's something that uh, is a real threat and it's going to be ongoing. Yeah. You know, one thing that you mentioned uh, this afternoon that we were not aware, or at least uh, not putting too much emphasis on, is the, is the disaster or emergency due to solar flares. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. It's kind of new, uh, uh, you know, that uh, people have been talking about it. Today. Yeah, solar flares are something that, that kind of ebb and flow with uh -huh. the sun. Um, they'll be called an electronic magnetic pulse. I see. Um, okay. And these are, are, are really uh, just high concentration of radiation that can cause massive uh, blackouts and, and kind of fry okay. electrical okay. systems because the electricity and everything that's, that's evolving through them doesn't react well when this radiation occurs uh, or, or magnifies with them. So it's, uh, it's a concern globally. I think it's a concern of, of solar flares. It's, it's been a concern uh, with some in, in emergency management, homeland security, uh -huh. of having uh, an electromagnetic pulse at a, uh, um, a crevice in an earthquake or a, uh, a volcano to try to spur like a natural disaster. Right. Okay. So that's something that um, that's constantly being monitored and, and NASA and everybody else is involved in that. So I, I'm glad that there's some, you know, somebody like you in your office at least involved in all those areas to, you know, to, to provide that communication deal as far as let the an information come from Frankfurt to the you know, right people at the local level or so. And you've been working on this for a while and also you know, helping our region or so. What do you see you know, in, in, in the second that, uh, the minute we have, what do you see upcoming thing that is coming up, you know, that we should be, you know, more concerned about or just working together. When it comes to to the emphasize security. that earthquake planning. And, and okay. the one okay. thing that I would say, if we plan for that earthquake standard, uh -huh. flooding, tornadoes, and others are almost simplistic mm -hmm. disasters because there will never be a disaster that will be more um, uh, complicated mm -hmm. to deal with than, than that's an exercise plan. You know? Yes, okay. and, and the, we're going to have about a seven or eight state exercise in June that's oh, going to be focused okay. just on a New Madrid earthquake. Those uh -huh. states include Missouri, Illinois, Tennessee, Arkansas. Arkansas and others. Right. So uh, planning and just making sure that you can take care of yourself and, and right. your family right. for multiple right. days at a time in case a disaster like that strikes, similar to what, what happened right. during the ice so Get prepared, get prepared, get, get prepared. prepared, get ready. Get yeah. prepared. Aaron, thank you. Thank you for being on the Grad Dialogue. Thank you for spending your time in Grad. You know, you spent a couple of days here. Uh, and again, I, I echo what you're saying, you know, that you know, we got to be prepared, you know, and, and in order to get better prepared, that's where your office comes in to help us to get prepared. Again, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions about the Homeland Security Office in Frankfurt, as far as how can you take part and work with them and also work at the local level to make sure that we are ready for any potential disaster in the future, you can contact uh, the Grad Office or also you can contact the Homeland Security Office in Frankfurt. Thank you very much.